What's up, model gangsters? It is time for one of my favorite things, which is testing some paint. Now, this time, um, <laughs> as opposed to all the other times, I think this is going to be pretty interesting because this is an offering from a brand new paint manufacturer called Mission Models. Uh, now, if, like me, you had not heard of Mission Models before just now or uh, just recently, then you wouldn't be the only one. But uh, I had a very good conversation with the owner, uh, a fellow by the name of John Tamkin, and he kind of laid out the history for me. Um, as I understand it, these guys were around for quite a while, um, I guess maybe five years ago, uh, before that, and um, kind of uh, got popularized because of their offerings of some special tools, things like chisels and so forth, that sold really well, but then they kind of got uh, to the point where they were getting a lot of competition from, you know, companies that were sourcing in China, etc. And uh, just didn't feel like they were making the profits that they wanted to and decided to, you know, shut it down before uh, things got ugly. So, um, at any rate, uh, John never lost his passion for the hobby and for making good products. And so he has recently reappeared with this line of paints. And what I think is really interesting about it is that uh, Mike Rinaldi, who I'm a big fan of, uh, has been involved with these guys from the way back, um, even in their first incarnation. And, uh, and Mike has confirmed this. Um, apparently Mike was uh, extensively involved in the, uh, the sort of design phase, if you want to call it that, uh, for these paints. Uh, where they were doing all of the formulation and testing. Um, and, and my understanding is that that was all done with a, a custom paint chemistry outfit here in the United States. Um, and um, that it's you know gone through a, a pretty rigorous process of formulation and testing. Now, you're probably going, well, what kind of paint is it? Tell us. Uh, it's acrylics. Uh, you know, it fits into the category of what we think of as acrylics. And more specifically, these are water-based acrylics. Um, although it's a little more complicated than that, and uh, we'll get into that here in a minute. But um, it's, it's interesting looking stuff. This is, the, uh, this is the brochure that came with the box of paints that John sent me. And the first thing I notice is that it's just really um, beautiful uh, marketing material. I definitely see Mike Rinaldi's influence on this. His photo photography style is uh, definitely, uh, definitely showing up here. So it's good stuff. But obviously, you know, a pretty brochure does not, does not have anything to do with how well paint performs at your workbench. And that's what we aim to find out with this test. And uh, I promised that I would do my usual thing of just putting it through it, putting it through its paces. Um, I'm not coming in with any preconceived notions on this stuff. I've never used it before. Um, you know, I've I've seen some various things that have been said about it that seem favorable, but uh, you know, my objective is just to be objective and see how it works because. That's my only loyalty, is to results. So, it's going to be interesting. Now, one thing that uh, is, is also unique about uh, Mission Models paints is, and this is going to, going, to, going to come up in the testing that I do here, is that this is a slightly different approach. Um, whereas, um, and again, I'm kind of just you know putting my own verbiage on what John has told me and what I've read. Um, whereas most paints are completely mixed in the bottle um, to achieve whatever properties the particular manufacturer decides are important, uh, these are not. Now, if that sounds weird, just bear with me. I'll explain. Um, you know, what we call acrylic paints have really got all kinds of things in them. And the acrylic emulsion polymers that are... are that make up the the binder um, 
uh, are, are really just part of it. There are other additives in there as well, things like vinyls, polyurethanes, and those are the things that determine, you know, how tough a, a paint layer you get when you're finished, how glossy, how flat, um, you know, whether it's like rubbery or whether it's hard, whether it'll sand, whether it won't sand. All of those things are a result of, of a mixture of proprietary ingredients that, you know, quite frankly, it's a lot like sausage. I mean, there's tons of recipes out there for what we call acrylic paints. And about the only thing that they have in common is uh, that they contain some sort of acrylic polymer uh, binder system um, that, you know, carries the pigment and so forth. So, uh, anyway, what's different about Mission is that this is more of a paint system where you have different components that you can combine to get the results that you want. And they want you to mix those components in very specific ways. Um, and we will get into that here directly. So, without any further jaw flapping on my part, let's get into it. I don't know if this review is going to be long or short or what, uh, but I am definitely going to be thorough, so we better get started. Okay, first things first, let's just take a quick look inside this brochure because uh, this has a, uh, a little bit of commentary about how the paints themselves are supposed to work. Um, now, what he says here right off the bat is that this is an acrylic non-solvent based paint system. And what he specifically means is that, you know, he's talking about solvents in the old school term of, you know, things that are hot, like lacquer thinners, mineral spirits, kerosene, etc. So this is a water-based material. Um, and there's some other things in here about them being triple pigmented for maximum opacity, light fast, they won't fade over time, um, etc. Now, I don't know what all of that means. Some of that is marketing speak, I'm sure, but it certainly sounds interesting. Uh, they are supposed to be airbrush ready uh, from the bottle, but um, as we'll learn, there are uh, additives that you can put in at your discretion to uh, improve on the properties that, that you get right out of the bottle. Uh, so we'll see how that works. It says cleanup is easy with water, um, but our thinner is the preferred method for total cleanup, so we'll be taking a look at that. So, uh, what colors do they offer? Um, I'm not going to go through... Well, first, before we get, get to that, let's, let's take a look at this part of the, uh, of the brochure. Okay, so here he talks about the primer. Uh, the MRP primer is a two-part system that must, in bold letters, be activated using a mo a Mission Model Products Thinner only. So that's going to be interesting, and we'll take a look at that. Um, I'm always interested in good primer. Um, because the MMP primer is thicker than that of our paint, it must be reduced with our MMP thinner. Uh, no tricks. Reduce approximately 20 to 30 percent with MMP thinner. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how that works. Uh, let's see. Dries to touch within 15 minutes. That's good. That's what I would expect from a good acrylic primer. Okay, uh, MMP Thinner not, is acrylic, non-solvent based, and odorless. We have found that mixing is best performed at the ratio of 20% to 30% thinner to paint. Note, if you over thin the paint, it will become more transparent, not covering properly and possibly run. Uh, so that's good information. Um, you can always add thinner as needed. Recommended air pressure is 10 to 15 PSI. Okay, now, uh, here's, here's where it gets a little more interesting. Polyurethane mix additive. Okay, this is, this is the component that you add to the paint if you want, which, as I understand it, is designed to make it uh, flow better, more self-leveling, and more durable. Polyurethane mix additive is an automotive grade acrylic intermix. It allows for an incredibly level smooth finish, etc., 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 increased durability for sanding, uh, and so on. 
So we highly recommend adding MMP polyurethane mix additive to your paint mixture. Um, and they say to simply add a few drops. So we're gonna see exactly what that means. Um, you know, one thing has become pretty clear from everything that I've read and from, and from things that John has told me is that this is more like an automotive paint system where you really need to pay attention to your ratios. Um, you know, with automotive paints, they don't screw around. Um, I'll give you an example here. Uh, this is my can of, uh, whoops, my can of Upal, which is uh, uh, 2K clear urethane gloss. And you can see right here, uh, four to one, or it's four to one, four to one, four to one. What they're telling you is that's the ratio that you mix this with the uh, hardener that catalyzes it. Hence the fact that it's a two-part uh, clear polyurethane. And when they say four to one, that's what they mean, four to one. Not looks like four to one, or feels like, or sounds like, or whatever. They mean four to one. And auto, you know, guys that have, have used automotive paints are used to that. But in the model making community, I know lots of people have a little bit different attitude of, well, just mix it to where it looks like skim milk or whole milk or nonfat milk or almond milk or whatever kind of milk you drink. You know, you know, you never really know. And a lot of guys like to mix in the cup. I'm not a fan of any of the above. I'm a drop counter. And I think that uh, John and, and, his, and his gang know that about me, and that's part of why they asked me to check it out, because I'm already used to working that way with paint. Um, I like to keep my ratios consistent from project to project so that I know how my paint is going to behave at all times. So that may be a little bit of a different approach for some of you guys who are used to doing it more by feel. We'll see how that goes. Anyhow, these are the colors that they currently offer. Uh, and this is a, a pretty nice, a pretty nice selection to start with. But they have told me that they are going to be expanding this directly. Uh, they wanted to get a good start with things that they thought would appeal. I think really mostly to armor guys. There's lots of shades of olive drabs here that you can work with to create various effects. So I think this is a pretty solid start uh, of colors. Uh, and with that. Let's take a look at the actual stuff. Now, I've, uh, I've got the box here, and um, you <laughs> I think these guys would probably prefer that I had uh, worked with this stuff already before doing my test. But, nah, that's not how I roll. I like to get into it. I like to live dangerously. Um, and if you look, <laughs> this is the exact photo that I posted on Facebook a few days ago of this box of paint. It hasn't been touched in any way since then. And uh, um, so we're gonna, you guys are gonna be experiencing this, uh, you know, for the first time uh, right along with me. Now, one thing that John has talked about is that because of the way that these paints are formulated, they are not supposed to separate uh, as easily as uh, a lot of the paints that we're used to. And we all have experienced that, where you get out your bottle of paint and it's some kind of clear liquid uh, with uh, some gunk on the bottom of the, uh, of the bottle. And you may or may not get them to recombine uh, successfully. I know that I experienced that with some Hataka paints last year where I bought one of their sets of six and when they showed up half of them were separated and I never could get them to unseparate no matter how much I shook them and uh, that was a big disappointment uh, you know because I had paid for six and got three so uh, if they don't separate, that's a good thing. Um, all right, so I'm going to, let's see, I was hoping that while I was digging around in here, I would find the primer uh, because I definitely want to 
test that stuff out. I've got some paints out here. I've got the polyurethane. You can see a little bottle of that. And I've got a bottle of the thinner here. Now the interesting thing to me is that even though we have said that this is a water-based acrylic uh, and not solvent-based at all, uh, the first thing you'll notice on the thinner is that it says it contains 2-butoxyethanol. Now, I happen to know that Tamiya X20A thinner also contains uh, butoxyethanol. Um, a lot of people think that Tamiya X20A is nothing more than IPA or rubbing alcohol. That is, in fact, not true. It's about 54% water and uh, about 35% uh, uh, butanols, which is what this is, basically, or a similar. I'm not a chemist, so I, don't, get me, don't get me lying here. But at any rate, X20A is a blend of water and alcohols. And uh, that may be what this is as well. We'll see uh, if it smells like alcohol uh, here in a minute. Okay, so I did some digging around in there and uh, uh, I did find the primers, which is good. There's a, a gray and a black and a white. So that'll be good uh, because I definitely want to compare this to uh, Steinle Res, uh, which is my go-to acrylic primer these days. And uh, also to see, you know, how it favors against, you know, your regular old school lacquer primers like Mr. Surfacer 1500. Now, um, already I can see in looking at some of these bottles, which I haven't, you know, done anything other than take out of the box. There, you know, there is clearly some stratification in there. It's not what I would call separation really that much. I mean, it's not, it's not uh, the case where... We've got clear liquid and then something, you know, in the bottom, like like this is what I consider separation, okay? When you look at this bottle of Mr. Paint, this is a lacquer, obviously, and you can see there's some relatively clear stuff at the top, and then all of the pigment is down at the bottom. So that's kind of what I consider to be separation. Um, these don't really seem to be doing that. They just are just kind of, I don't know. I just don't really know any other way to say it than that they're kind of just stratified. You can sort of see that there. So obviously you're gonna have to shake them up. Now, one thing that's cool, can you hear that? I'm shaking it. There is a mixing ball in each one of these. And I love that. I think that's awesome. I wish everybody did that. Now that little tiny bit of shaking that I did did not uh, completely uh, mix it up, so, but that's okay. I'll do some more shaking um, and uh, we'll actually get one of these open and do a little spraying here in a minute. Okay, so I have got myself set up here. Uh, hopefully uh, I'm ma making an attempt to be a little less of a pig than I am in some of my testing. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just run it like I run it. Uh, I, I do keep things pretty clean, but like for example, I did not clean my airbrush just for this test. I never do. I want this to be as close to everyday usage as possible. Now, when I was unpacking the box, I noticed a couple of things. One is this bottle of transparent medium. And then I found this uh, bottle of transparent light rust. And so I texted John and he immediately texted me back. And he says, hi, Will, excellent. Transparent medium is the carrier without pigment. It can be used for creating tints, etc. So that's pretty cool. Uh, there's a transparent rust, for example, I dusted over burnt iron, that sort of thing. Um, at the moment, there's only one transparent, which is the rust. Great for light spray tints, etc. So that answers that question. That's pretty cool. We may test that out and see how that works. But right off the bat, the first thing I want to do is try out the black primer. And I've already got uh, the bottles 
opened up and ready for that. The first thing you'll notice when you open these bottles is that they have the little safety seal on them, which is a good thing. Um, although, uh, John, you may want to take note of this. When I opened the primer, the safety seal on it was uh, not even attached, whereas it was stuck pretty firmly on uh, the other bottles that I opened. Okay, first things first. Um, in the interest of being clean, okay, I'm going to use some uh, Ultimate uh, alcohol-based airbrush cleaner and uh, I'm going to wipe down... Uh oh, that's John again. Feel free to call me. Okay, John, we'll call you if we need to. You just hang tight. All right, uh, I'm going to wipe down this piece of plastic here. This is a wing from a discarded uh, Accurate Miniatures B25 Mitchell kit, and it will make an excellent test subject. And now it's all nice and clean. So we can, uh, we can get right into it. Um, so the first thing is to mix up some primer. And uh, let's double check. Uh, it does not say on the, okay, wait a second here. Let's see, on the primer, the label's a little bit different. It says here, contains 2-butoxyethanol. Okay, applied directly to plastic, resin and metal, most any substrate. Whoa, water-based paints may be applied over Mission Models Primer uh, 30 minutes after application. Uh, if applying solvent-based paint, allow 48-hour dry time unless wiped with a degreaser or sanded prior to painting application. So that means if we want to use this primer but go over top of it with, say, a Mr. Paint lacquer, we'd need to allow 48 hours. So that's good to know. This product must be thin with MMP with MM thinner only, approximately 25% per volume. Uh, up, apply two to three light coats. Allow each coat to dry before applying the next coat. Okay, so that all seems pretty reasonable. I'm gonna do my best to get this stuff shaken up and we're going to get right to it. Um, now what I will do is we'll spray some of it uh, and some of it we'll paint 30 minutes later with a top coat because we want to see how that works out uh, you know if we go that route but I also really want to know how the stuff is sands so we will be uh, waiting uh, 48 hours for the sanding test Actually, we'll test it at 24 hours uh, as well because that's kind of the way I'm used to working with Steinal Res. It takes 24 hours to get a really good hard cure on Steinal Res and make it sand dusty. And uh, so anyway, all right, so um, I'm going to pour out. Uh, I'm going to try for 10 or 20 drops. We'll see how it goes. So that was a couple of drops. Okay, so that, I believe, was 20 drops. We'll add a couple more just for good measure. All right. So, and I like that. It came dropping out of that bottle better than I expected it to. These bottles are pretty rigid, and I hate rigid bottles uh, because uh, they just, you know, when you get trying to squeeze, uh, you know, and get exact amounts of paint out of them, they don't work very well. The uh, Vallejo... Uh, metal color bottles are a great example of that. They look really good. They're nice and transparent, which is great. And they have a little dropper on top, which is nice. But when you actually try to squeeze them, they don't squeeze worth a damn and it ends up being a wrestling match. So anyway, uh, now we're gonna put in some thinner. So if we want 25% thinner, uh, I put in uh, 20 drops of paint, so we're gonna need five drops of thinner. So let's see how this goes. Uno, dos, tres, 
Cuatro, cinco. We'll do one more just to be on the safe side. So there we go. I believe that was pretty accurate. Now, I'm going to get that nice and stirred up and see what we think. And the first thing I think is that that looks nice. I mean, that's about the consistency of uh, Steinel Res black out of the bottle. Um, so we'll see. Um, and again, I'm going to just keep referring to things that I use on a daily basis because those are my benchmarks. I mean, that's what I'm that's what I'm going to compare to. Um, so. I'm not necessarily saying that those things are the best. They are just what I'm used to. Now, hopefully I won't blow myself out here. I'm going to spray this stuff right out here on the bench and not get, you know, all crazy about doing it in the spray booth because it is alcohol-based and the noise gets annoying and all of that. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get away without that. Um, I will spray in real time for at least a second, but I may speed it up so that you guys don't have to to watch each and every pass. So we'll see. But here we go. Okay, so first thing right off the bat, that's that's just kind of one light coat. And you can see this is not necessarily the best spray gun for this application of primer because, you know, I'm working at uh, 15 PSI as recommended. Um, 20 is kind of my baseline, but I've had it on 15 because I've been using uh, Mr. Paint a, a lot. Um, so. Um, you know, in good shape on that, but this isn't necessarily the best spray gun. For priming, I'm more inclined to use my Iwata HPTH with a 0.5 millimeter needle, um, and maybe even with the fan tip, uh, just depends, so that I get broader coverage. Um, you know, for priming, I don't want to have to do a thousand tiny little passes like I was doing there. But you can see that uh, it, it went on pretty smooth, um, there's nothing to object to there. I mean, this is a super smooth piece of plastic to start with, with no texture on it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like what I'm seeing so far. Um, also, look, let me just jam my finger right in the middle of that. You guys saw, I just sprayed it and it's already touched dry. So that's cool. That's good because I want to get on with it and we're going to spray uh, another pass. Okay, so I went a little heavier that time, as kind of would be my normal practice with, with, a, with a primer. Um, and I'm not doing super good with my spray discipline, my technique here. Um, hopefully, uh, then this will end up being a worst case test. But you can see immediately that, uh, hang on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the spray gun down here for a second so we can take a look at this. You can see uh, almost immediately I, it was it went down with a lot of of kind of gross orange peel texture that I could see right as I was spraying it, and that is already starting to level itself out. And um, you know it makes me wonder how much of a cousin of Steinel Res this stuff is. 
uh, because even though Steinal Res is supposed to be all about the water-based, and the Badger guys will tell you in no uncertain terms that if you feel the need to thin your Steinal Res, that you should only use water. I know some people do it with alcohol and get away with it, but my point is that Steinal Res also has a tendency to go down uh, looking kind of gross and, and rough, and then amaze you with how much it levels out uh, over the course of, uh, of a few minutes. So anyway, I'm gonna adjust the camera angle here, um, just get a little bit closer uh, before we do the next pass. And um, we'll give this uh, a, another minute or two until we think it's dry, and then uh, we'll hit it a third time. Okay, so here I am just a few minutes later and it's already dry to the touch. Um, and uh, so even though I don't necessarily think that I need to, I am gonna go ahead and uh, spray another layer on because uh, two to three light layers is, is what's called for. Now, I see a little bit of, of roughness or texture there. But that's, some of that is just down to my piss poor spray discipline. Um, you know, overall, this looks pretty good so far. But let's lay down a, a third uh, and maybe more disciplined coat. Um, hopefully we won't run out. I did, uh, you saw how much I mixed up and you can see that most of it is, uh, is gone. Whoops. And there's the paint cup right in my lap. Good thing I'm wearing dark colored trousers today. Hold on a second while I deal with that. Anyhow, hey, we run it real school in this lab, right? Okay, so let's go. Let's do, let's do one more. Hopefully we'll get all the way through this one. And again, I'm gonna change I'm going to change direction on this one. Okay, so there's where I ran out. So, no big deal. Uh, I was intentionally blasting it. You guys could hear, I'm sure, that I went on uh, quite a bit heavier. And you can see that there is, that, that, you know, that, that, that there, it looks, it looks kind of gross. But it's leveling literally as I'm watching it. So we're going to just let that sit there. And um, that will be the basis for... Uh, what comes next and just so you guys know as I always do with my testing that I am sticking to the letter of the law and we don't want to put any top coat on this before half an hour uh, let's look and see what time it is okay there's John's text it is 1 46 p.m. you can see that right there so We'll get back to that in about half an hour. In the meantime, the first thing that I've got to do is get this airbrush cleaned out um, from all of uh, what we just did there. Now, I'm going to break one of my rules because this is a test. And uh, I am going to use the thinner to uh, do the cleaning. Now, the reason that I say I'm breaking one of my rules is because um, I don't generally I, I don't generally like to do that uh, for the simple fact that thinner is usually more expensive than cleaner. Oh wait, that's the polyurethane. I better not use that to clean anything with, right? Um, let's make sure I'm not doing something stupid here. Okay, this is the thinner and the cleaner. So anyway, for this one time, I'm going to uh, use the thinner as my cleaner because I want to see uh, I want to see how it does. But normally, I use my own cleaners, and I will continue to do that. Or I use UMP cleaner, you know, whatever I have in, in you know, on hand. Uh, but the point is, 
that I'm not a fan of, of using thinner as cleaner. Um, okay, so let's just see how this goes. And again, I'm going to keep this on camera. And this is what you're observing here is my normal routine. You know, after I squirt some paint, uh, I dump whatever cleaner I'm using uh, in the in the cup and uh, the first thing I do is give it a good scrub with this brush that I keep handy at my airbrush station and uh, then I will usually blow some of that. I have a waste cup over in my spray booth and I'll blow some of that out uh, just to get rid of the big chunks. And after that little operation, that's, that's what's left in, in the cup. And the reason I'm showing you that is, uh, I know it seems boring, but I'm, I'm comparing it already again with, with Steinal Res. Steinal Res is a bitch to clean out of your airbrush. And uh, even if you get to it quickly, you will find that it's sticky and, uh, I mean, I don't mean sticky, I just mean stubborn. Uh, to uh, to get out of there and uh, even though I, I do my first stages of cleaning Steinal Res with an alcohol based cleaner I always finish up with some lacquer thinner just good old hardware store lacquer thinner because I know that I have to uh, to get it all out of there and even then it's not perfect I just have come to accept that after uh, a, a couple of weeks of, of steady work where I'm switching back and forth between paint systems and, you know, if Steinal Res is, is part of that process, I'm going to have some of it collected in, in the innards of my airbrush, then it's going to require some, some effort. So, anyway, let's get the uh, tip of the air cap and the needle cleaned out there to see how we're doing. Still got some some chunks in there, but getting close. Not too bad. Give that a quick wipe with a rag. And uh, this is always kind of a test here. Let's put some more of this stuff in there. And it definitely smells like alcohol. Because uh, it is, right? So let's do a little bit of backflow, and that'll sometimes that'll tell you where you're at. If you backflow and you get a bunch of gunk, then you know that you've got your work cut out for you. But this isn't too bad. You know, there's still a little bit down in there. I mean, that's definitely not what I would call flushed clear. Um, not yet, anyway. But that's not that's not a, anything I wouldn't expect. All right, I don't want to dick around with a bunch of flushes with alcohol. I'm going to just get straight to my hardware store lacquer thinner, and shoot some of that in there, and we're going to bubble that up and see what we get. Almost inevitably, if I'm using Steinal Res when I do this step, even if my last flush with an alcohol-based cleaner looked clear, I'll get more when I switch over to lacquer thinner. And you can see that this is not too bad. I mean, it's, you know, it's cleaned out of there pretty well. So I'm going to call this airbrush clean enough to go forward. That's as clean as I would get it uh, during my normal day-to-day -day work. And uh, we will give this the requested half an hour to dry and come back. Okay, gangsters. It is... 216 so it is just a little bit uh, more than 30 minutes since we last looked at this and um, so it should now be you know, I mean it was should have been dry enough before to top coat it with uh, another acrylic but we are following instructions the first thing I want to do is take a good close look at the surface of this um, I've got my optivisor on and um, peering at it intently and um, 
here, here's here's what I think. Um, and I will let you guys have a, a close look on camera as well. Um, and you can decide what you think. We'll uh, get zoomed in here. Hopefully you guys will be able to uh, observe this as well as I was able to with my Optivisor on. Um, I think you'll be able to see there that there is, is some texture. Um, it, it looks... It looks pretty smooth at first blush, and I don't think it's really too bad. But when you get in there tight, okay, you can see that there is some grain. Not horrible, uh, but let's compare that to something else. This is uh, from the same kit. And this uh, was primed, I don't know, maybe a month ago uh, using Mr. Surfacer 1500 thinned with uh, Mr. Leveling Thinner. And uh, let me get a close look at that. I think you can see that that is about as tight and grain free as you're going to find this section up here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was not Mr. Surfacer. What this was, was uh, this was uh, this mule initially had some uh, all clad uh, 309 micro filler on it. You can see that remnants of that right here. And that's wh uh, where I was testing it after a disaster I had with that bottle of primer where it, for some reason, started blowing grain all over everything. Um, and uh, that's what you're seeing right there. It's been painted over with Mr. Surfacer 1500. But that's what I would call a pretty bad grain. I mean, that's visible easily with the naked eye. Um, and uh, certainly not certainly not good. But you can see here that the Mr. Surfacer 1500 only is very nice. And that's, you know, again, why I continue to say that lacquer primers that don't go bad on you <laughs> uh, are really kind of the benchmark. Um, but this is, is, is not too bad. Um, not great. I'm not going to say I love it. Uh, and we'll see how that sands out. Um, and, uh, you know, I may find that my, if I work with this a little bit more, that maybe my spray discipline gets a little bit better. I actually put it on heavier than I normally feel like I would. Um, so that may have something to do with it because I didn't see much of that grain with that first light pass. So... Uh, whatever grain is there may be a result of me just blowing it on so heavily. Um, that remains to be seen. We'll do some more testing. But the next thing is we're going to actually put some color on that. All right, first thing is I'm, that I'm going to do is divide this wing up into a couple of panels. And this is just some Tamiya tape here and uh, this... Uh, will all make sense here in a second, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to spray this straight out of the bottle because obviously we want to see how it does under those conditions and then I'm going to add some thinner to it at the prescribed ratio and then I'm going to uh, add the poly to it and hopefully that will give us 
kind of kind of three baseline conditions that the instructions for the paint cover and uh, we'll see how that goes so we'll have sort of three different areas for that all right now hopefully you recognize something else I'm doing here which is making a little bit of a masking test I didn't do much if anything to detack that Tamiya tape and I'm rubbing it down there pretty firmly so we'll see what if any effect uh, yanking that masking tape straight off of that primer has uh, later um, get the rest of this gunk out of my airbrush it still had some lacquer thinner in there so definitely want to rinse that out I'm going to use a little bit of UMP cleaner Make sure I don't have any remnants of any lacquer thinner inside there. That should be good. Okay, now, first thing is straight out of the bottle. So, let's just do exactly that. Straight out of the bottle. And what we have here is the RAL7027 Sand Grau. And I purposely picked... A, a light color for reasons that'll be uh, clear here in a minute and, and I just discovered these bottles do squeeze pretty well um, they're not as maybe not as rigid as I thought they were so that's good all right so let's uh, let's just go at this a little bit let's see what we what we get Okay, so the first thing I noticed, which I would assume you guys did too, is that it dries really quick. I mean, you can see it going from light to dark almost as we watch it dry. And it also goes on uh, pretty, uh, pretty opaque and pretty flat. Um, and that's just obviously just a light, just a light coat there. I'm going to go for a full density coat um, just because we want to see you know how it goes but um, it does it sprays nice right out of the bottle so let's let's go for a heavier application and it does dry fast Not as dense maybe as I thought it was. I mean, it appears to go on really dense because it's such a light color, but you can definitely still see that, you know, even as, as wet as I'm spraying, that I'm not getting a fully opaque layer there, um, which immediately makes it, for me, a little bit different from things like, like Vallejo, for example. Vallejo, I find, especially straight out of the bottle, is really difficult to graduate your opacity because it's kind of all or nothing with that stuff. So let's just see what it takes to get a fully opaque layer and how that looks. And that's 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 pretty close if not if not there. Um, you can see it starting to dry just a little less quickly, uh, but it definitely, I mean, I'm, I can watch as it, as it dries pretty much right there as I'm looking at it. And you guys can, can get a, a close look at that too. So, you know, that's, that's I mean, that's pretty straightforward. It's, it's pretty flat, that's good, it's real flat, which kind of surprises me for an acrylic. 
most uh, acrylics I find straight out of the bottle uh, are not that flat, so that's good. I personally prefer all my military paints to be flatty, flat, flatison. Um, so I like that. That's good. All right. Um, that's three layers. I'm going to just let that dry. And uh, I'm going to dump this out, and then we're going to mix some with some thinner and see what the difference is. Okay, so here we go. First things first, let's count some drops. Okay, so I think we got uh, right at 20 drops there. I squeezed a few of them a little too hard and they ended up being gloops instead of drops, but I think we are pretty close. Okay, now for some thinner. Now he calls for between 10 and 20%. Let's just go with 20% right off the bat and see. So if we've got 20 drops of paint, then 20% uh, thinner will be four drops of thinner. So. Okay, so there's four or five. I think that was five drops. I did an extra one just to make sure because I wasn't confident in one of those drops. But that should be... That should be a 20% thinned ratio. And let's see what we think about that. I mean, just looking at the legs on it in the, in the mixing cup, you know, that seems like a pretty reasonable, a pretty reasonable density. Not, uh, not anything unusual about that. So let's see what we get. And I didn't go to huge lengths to clean that out because we're doing the same color. Uh, so let me blow some of that through just to make sure that we're into the into the mix. And let's see. And let's see what we get. So the first thing I notice is that this stuff is, is really translucent and it's definitely more translucent, you know, with 20% thinner in it than it was before because obviously we've reduced not only the viscosity a little bit, but we've reduced the concentration of pigment and binder. So that's kind of what you would expect, but uh, spray's fine. Um, it's just obviously pretty translucent. and. That, uh, that, that's, that, I really find that interesting because, again, I, I find most of these water-based acrylic paints to be pretty opaque. And that makes it difficult for things like black basing, which is going to be one of the key questions I want to answer with this stuff. So, um, as we go forward with the test, uh, we definitely will be, be looking at that. And that's what I'm going to do a little bit of on the next panel. But for now, let me just see what we can do here. And this time, let's just spray, let's just work it a little bit more in some random ways like we might actually be doing here if this were a real project and not just spray bombing it. I'm, I'm spraying a moderately small pattern here and uh, I'm already surprised at how well behaved it is. One thing John says is that because of the way that they, they formulate this stuff, that you should not see spidering 
which again is something that's pretty common with water-based acrylics. When you really start trying to get in tight and spray small, spidering can be a real problem because it doesn't have a lot of bite on a, on a smooth surface and uh, it can run away from you in a hurry. So that's promising, we'll see. So I'm using some terrible spray discipline here and kind of piling it up in a couple of places. And I'm purposefully just, you know, being careless because I want to see how forgiving this stuff is. And, um, you know, thus far, uh, not bad. Interesting. I got to say, I, I, it's behaving in not a way that I would expect uh, from a... a a paint that's that's classified as a water-based acrylic doesn't have any smell to it the alcohol in the thinner is pretty undetectable I mean it doesn't even smell as much as as Tamiya does and I don't think the smell of Tamiya is objectionable but this stuff is definitely almost odor free and um, the, the way that it sprays right now reminds me honestly a lot more of a lacquer than anything, just in the way that it behaves, uh, the tightness of it. So that's cool because uh, I'm a fan of lacquers, and so anything that acts like a lacquer is 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 good. I dig it. So all right, I think that's that's a, a enough of of that. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna mix up the batch for the poly. So we'll count some drops. Okay, so that's 20 drops of paint. Did a little better that time. Let's get some thinner here. For some reason, I can't get the thinner to come dripping out of the end of the dropper the way the paint does. Okay, so five drops of thinner. Just exactly what I put in the first batch. Now, let's think about this for a second, okay? Uh, we've got, uh, let's see what the instructions here say. Okay, it contains a chemical, blah, blah, blah. Contains, blah, blah, blah. Uh, mix 10 to 25% per volume. One thing that I've noticed is that there's a little bit of inconsistency in the sources here. Um, it's, for example, it says 10 to 20 percent per volume here on this label for the poly, but then in other places it says um, uh, just use a couple of drops. So uh, that might be one thing that I would first of all recommend to John and his gang is to tighten up their copy and make sure that everything is consistent. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go with this at the 25% per volume. Now this is 20 drops of paint plus uh, 5 drops of thinner. Give me a total of 25 drops. So 25% uh, of that is going to be 6 times 4 is 24. So we'll go with, we'll go with 6 drops of poly. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, there we go. I like it. I, I like mixing my stuff precisely and accurately. It makes me feel better, it makes me sleep better at night. All right, so now get this nice and stirred up. Now I asked John, I said, John, why if the poly makes the paint flow better and, and level better and more durable and all that, why don't you just put the poly in the paint to begin with? And he said, well, that's where you get into the shelf life issues. That, uh, you know, if you have those additives in there from the very beginning, 
that that's the kind of thing that can cause some of those ill effects like separation, um, you know, paint going gloopy on you, etc. And this also gives you the freedom to adjust the ratio of poly once you sort of understand the baseline and what effect it has. So we'll see. I'm obviously going by the letter of the law to start with. So here we go. All mixed up. And again, I didn't do a like bonus job of cleaning the old stuff out. So I'm going to just blow some of that through right off the bat. Now, here's one thing that I noticed immediately, and this did not surprise me. If you guys were watching closely after I finished spraying this unthinned section over here, I had a pretty good amount of overspray over here on the other side of the tape. And I have quite a bit less uh, on this side of the tape after spraying it with some, with some reducer in it. And that doesn't surprise me because I find that thicker paints tend to splatter more and have more overspray. So what I'm hoping is that with this mix, with the same amount of thinner and um, with uh, uh, the poly in it, that it's going to let me spray really tight because we're going to try some black basing technique on this uh, on this go round. But first, let's just let's just spray some right here just like we did with the other other part and see how that goes so seems to spray pretty similar again the overspray is nice and tight uh, it's not drying maybe quite as fast I mean that stuff dried almost immediately uh, when I was putting it down before and that's again what you would expect from a leveling agent. Uh, that's how it allows the leveling to take place is by retarding the drying rate a little bit and allowing the uh, the paint to flow together uh, a little bit more. So you can see it's still, I mean that that all right there would have dried in the time that it that I've been yakking about it um, and it's just now starting to uh, go to that same level of, uh, of, of uh, opacity. So Let's just, again, let's just keep spraying a little bit more right here. Okay, so there we go. You can see I just kind of abused my spray privileges all, all to hell there. And, you know, just purposely sprayed very sloppily. Because again, I want to I want to see what it, you know how forgiving this stuff is, and so far it is it is nestling down there uh, quite nicely. And what I'm going to get in this area right here is uh, sort of some some various levels of density, so that we can really see when it's dry, you know what the differences in surface finish are. So that's why. I'm taking a little chunk of it and just really dumping it on there because, look, everybody has their own style of, of painting, okay? Some people like to paint really translucently and build their layers up real slowly and kind of sneak up on the look that they're after. And some people prefer to paint in a more fully opaque uh, way and go for more solid colors. And you should be able to do either thing with whatever paint system you choose. So that's why I'm, I'm trying to kind of throw as much variety in here as possible so that uh, you guys can evaluate it against your own methods uh, as, as, as you see fit. But while that's drying, let's do a little bit. Let's try, let's try what we would do for some black basing. So already, I think I think I've got a little bit of maybe a little bit of stickiness on the uh, on the tip of of my airbrush there. So, and that's always a, a a challenge when you're trying to do black basing with acrylics because you get some tip dry and it becomes difficult 
to control it and really spray small. So what I'm going to do is I've got just a little bit of cleaner on this Q-tip and I'm going to just make sure that the tip of the needle is, is nice. And we'll see if we can't coax this stuff out real nice and tight. So I have to say, right off the bat, I would never expect to be able to do that with a water-based acrylic. I mean, I can do it with Tamiya using an alcohol blended thinner, but I would never expect anything that includes the word water on the label to, to let me do this. So right off the bat, that's... That's pretty damn cool. Getting some tip dry. Doesn't take much though before I start getting a little bit of spidering. You can see that. But again, I'm at 15, I'm, I'm at fully at 15 PSI, and I'm spraying in there pretty close. So if I drop the pressure down even lower, I might I might have better luck. And I and I'm I was trying to build up a little more of a solid area right there and see if I could paint a, a little a little square. So I got a little a little bit greedy, but You can do it, but I do have a little bit of build up there. We'll see. We'll see how it levels out. Okay, so let's take a close look at this um, and see what we think because this is a good opportunity to introduce some texture into your work. When uh, you know, you're know you spraying in tight like that and you get some spidering and um, it can you know pile up on you pretty quickly. But uh, yeah, you know what? Even right here where I was really sloppy and had a big gloopy pile of it right there. It it has seems to have uh, uh, leveled out pretty nicely, um, and that's not not a great uh, you know base for uh, black basing, uh, but this will illustrate the uh, this will illustrate the uh, the effect. Uh, We'll get into some more different things with that later on. But right now, um, since I've already got some, some paint in, in the spray gun, um, I want to just kind of continue to work with this and see what I can produce. Okay, now the next step in black basing is to come back with a really uh, translucent layer of paint. And when you're using lacquers or, or paints that you can use as lacquers, like Tamiya or Mr. Hobby, uh, what you really need for that blend layer, which is the, the thing that comes after this, which we kind of call the marbling layer, uh, what you really need for that is, is a, a, a paint to thinner ratio of like 
20 to 80 or, or even thinner. Um, just super, super translucent so that you can start to blend in all of this tonal variation without, uh, you know, hiding it all in one shot because, I mean, that's a real irritating thing when you've spent all of that time carefully spraying all of that lovely marbling effect <laughs> or really any kind of pre-shading um, and then your blend layers just immediately blow it all away and you can't see any of those beautiful tones anymore uh, so what I'm getting at is that what I want to do is I want to thin this stuff a bunch and just see what happens. I'm sort of convinced at this point that as translucent as it was, uh, when I was spraying it over here, that I really almost don't need to, that I'm, I, I, could, I could work with what I've got there. Um, but again, this is sort of, you know, this is real world testing and this is kind of what, you know, benchmarking against what, what we're used to and really thin color coats is the thing for black basing. So this is thinned at uh, the uh, at, at about 20%. So what I'm gonna do is if you look there, I've got, you can see how much I've got. Um, I'm gonna add enough thinner, enough additional thinner to make this by eyeball about a one-to-one -one ratio, which is like the minimum that I would use for black basing. And we're gonna see what happens. That's, and I'm sure that if John is watching this, hi John, that he's cringing at how badly I'm abusing his paint. But again, I know that these are the questions that you guys are, are gonna have. Um, so, Let's just see what, what happens. And it do, I did see somewhere in there, I think when we were reading in the brochure, that it said, thin it at whatever ratio you want to. So we're not technically breaking the law, right? Right? <laughs> okay, so here we go. So it is definitely super translucent. I mean, I practically didn't do anything uh, with that layer. And uh, it looks a little sketchy in a few places, but it seems to be leveling out. So we'll just keep going. Okay, so uh, that's that's I think good enough to sort of demonstrate the demonstrate the technique and see how it performs. Um, I'm going to go away and clean this airbrush right now before we let any more time pass by, and uh, I'll come right back in a minute. Okay, so it's just a couple of minutes later, and uh, I just had a a good look at this stuff with my Optivisor on, just to kind of look at the texture and the surface and see where where I'm at. And um, I, you know what, I'm really, I'm really pretty pleased. I mean, there's a, there's a little bit of grain in there that you can see, uh, maybe, but I think that that is probably all coming up from the primer uh, underneath. Um, which again, you know, that may be because I sprayed it on so heavily. I don't know. It really is kind of irrelevant, irrelevant because if I had any of that, even that slight amount of texture, after my priming, I would have sanded it down, uh, and that's what we'll test tomorrow over here on this section. But as far as this top coat goes, um, I feel like the texture is pretty good. It basically replicates uh, what was directly under it. So now let's do this. And yank this masking tape off of here and see what's up with that. Um, 
Now that, of course, is all about the wrong way to yank tape. And uh, I didn't have, didn't have any issue. There seems to be, I don't know, maybe uh, that's, I think that that's on the tape there is from my fingers. Nothing came off of the painted surface. Um, come on tape, get off of me. It's like one of those boogers you get on your finger and can't ever get rid of. <laughs> anyway, um, the uh, tape didn't pull up any of, of the primer. So that's a positive sign. And uh, we'll experiment some more with that later. But for now, I'm calling sort of phase one of this test uh, done and honestly pretty impressive. What I'm going to do next is get into some of the subsequent operations that I would want to be doing, like chipping, weathering with oils, acrylics, uh, not acrylics, uh, enamels, uh, masking, decals, and all of that sort of stuff. And hopefully we've got a good enough uh, amount of surface here that's got some paint on it that we can do all that. I think the first thing that I'll probably do uh, after this is dried for a day is uh, just randomly put down some more masking tape and then spray another color on top of this. Uh, well, I'll spray some hairspray on it first and then we'll spray another color on top of it so that we can chip and see how the chipping works uh, before we move on to the other stuff. But so far, so good. Okay, so it's next morning after all of the work that I recorded yesterday and it's time to get into kind of what I consider to be the second phase of this test, where uh, now that I've sprayed it, uh, it's time to really start using and abusing it because we all know that just getting the paint laid down is the first of many steps, at least, you know, for some. I mean, it obviously depends on your style. But before we get to that, let me take care of a little bit of housekeeping because I did some work off camera yesterday. I was really annoyed, um, you know, mostly with myself yesterday for getting this... Uh, level of grain in the or and, and grain is a weird term i mean what does that really mean does it mean large pigments does it mean little bumps what does it mean uh it's frustrating for me but what i'm talking about here is the slightly pebbly texture that i have here um i was frustrated with myself for getting that yesterday because look i'm serious about having smooth paint and i don't tolerate any kind of grain and it offends me <laughs> to think that uh, I screwed up somehow. Uh, so I actually talked to John about it. Um, he actually noticed in my commentary on Facebook that I that I mentioned getting some grain, and he called me. And I respect that. You know, this guy is dedicated to his product and to producing a good product. And I, you know, I got I got a lot of respect for that. Uh, but at any rate, um, I uh, we, we traded some ideas back and forth, and he suggested thinning the primer a little bit more. So I did. Um, he suggested 30%. I promptly ignored him and went to 50%. So uh, I mixed up the primer at 1 to 1 with uh, his thinner, and I got a better result. I also was a little less heavy-handed. This section here, I have two layers, and this section here, I have, I have three, just like I did yesterday. Both of them, I think you'll agree, are, are better um, than, uh, than what I had uh, yesterday. And in particular, uh, here where uh, I've only got two layers. Um, I, I would call this, at this point, uh, equivalent to what I would expect from Steinal Res, um, which for a lot of applications, armor in particular, is plenty good enough as it is. Um, I, you know, it's, I would say, 90% as smooth as what I would expect to get from uh, the combination of Mr. Surfacer 1500 
and Mr. Leveling Thinner. But look, that's an almost impossible hill to climb for an acrylic. So I don't think that's bad, a bad accomplishment at all. I think for an acrylic primer to get there, uh, to get 90% of the way there is, is pretty good. I mean, that's as smooth as you would get out of a lot of old school uh, lacquer primers out of a rattle can. So I don't see that as a problem at all. And if you're serious about getting smooth paint, then you should be accepting of the idea that you may have to do some sanding anyway. So I think it's, uh, I think it's good. It's, I think it's acceptable. Um, and uh, that's where I'm going to rest with the primer. So now, next thing is, uh, now that we've got this color coat on this thing here, the first thing I want to know is how durable is it? Um, so let's just see what we can find out. I'm going to use my thumbnail here and see if I can damage it, because that's one beef with acrylics is that they will scratch off. And I think you can see that I went after it with my thumbnail. I mean, I'm not being kind. And uh, this is the straight out of the bottle uh, portion. I was not able to damage it with my thumbnail. I mean, it kind of kind of burnishes it, gives it a little bit of a shinier appearance. Um, this part right here, uh, is thinned 20% uh, and no damage there. Uh, let's go after this one that's got the poly, which I would have expected to be the toughest of the of the three. And I'm definitely not causing any damage there. So look, that's great. Um, I, you know, there's other acrylics that I would never bet money on being able to get away with that uh, particular test so great passed with flying colors uh, in real life on that I promise you I had not done this before I didn't know how this was going to turn out and quite frankly I expected uh, the worst so that's good next thing that's going to happen is I'm going to lay down some hairspray and then I'm going to mask this, and then I'm going to add some color, and we're going to do a chipping test. So we'll come back to it here in just a few minutes.